bustled everywhere. She drove fierce arguments through debates in committee. She stalked the House of Commons corridors of power like an avenging angel. She had the kind of administrative stamina that Tony Blair lacked and that explains why so many of his bright ideas remained just that, whereas she accomplished several revolutions of policy. Welcome to the Acton Vault Podcast, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. John O'Sullivan, president of the Danube Institute in Budapest, accepted the 2011 Faith and Freedom Award on behalf of Lady Margaret Thatcher during Acton's 2011 anniversary dinner. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as previous episodes on our website at acton.org slash podcast. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Vault is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Uh, Madam Chairman, Father Sirico, Your Excellency, distinguished guests, friends and patrons of the Acton Institute, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege and a great pleasure for me to be here tonight on Lady Thatcher's behalf to receive the Faith and Freedom Award from the Acton Institute. Of course, I'm here in the humble role of an understudy on a night when the star has slipped um, and has had to cancel her performance. But it is a rare privilege to be an an understudy to Lady Thatcher, and it gives me the opportunity um, to pass on to you her thanks for the real honor you have done her and her best wishes for the continuing success of the Institute. I saw her in London shortly after she had learned that the Institute was minded to give her the Faith and Freedom Award. She was deeply grateful for the award and somewhat humbled. Freedom, yes. She is human enough to be proud of her role alongside Ronald Reagan in extending the boundaries of economic and political freedom worldwide. But she thinks of herself as simply an ordinary Christian believer, and she was somewhat surprised to find herself celebrated um, as a defender of the faith. I reminded her of her speech to the Church of Scotland Assembly, uh, which I was um, interested to discover, Father, you singled out for mention in the Institute citation for the award. And she replied, yes, but that's because the clergymen don't know any Adam Smith. (laughs) She added, the bishops in the Church of England are not much better. Though she made light of the attacks on her policy and person from leading churchmen of that day. And though she delivered a robust response to them, I believe they concerned her. She did not like to think that being orthodox in economics might mean being unorthodox in Christian belief. So like thousands of other people, she is relieved and heartened by the work of the Acton Institute in demonstrating the natural compatibility of Christian belief and sound economics, not least honest money. So she deeply regrets not being here tonight. But I have to tell you, she's under strict medical instructions to accept no public invitations. Um, when they were first, when those instructions were first given about three or four years ago, she used to ignore the rules. She would go to a meeting where she was supposed to remain completely silent and then jump on a chair saying, I know I'm supposed to make no speeches, but this is just a few words. Um, she would then speak uh, and answer questions for about half an hour. But though the spirit is still willing, the flesh gets weaker, and she now obeys her doctors on every issue except the reform of the National Health Service. (laughs) But she regrets not being able to accept the award in person, and she feels both humbled and flattered by uh, your bestowing it on her. Now, what kind of person is Margaret Thatcher? Why does she deserve, as she does deserve, your award tonight and your admiration more generally? I will try to answer that question in three ways. What she like as a person, what she like as a political leader, and what she like as a Christian believer. 
There's a well-known saying that no man is a hero to his valet. The proper response to that was given by Hegel, who said that this was true, not because the hero is not a hero, but because the valet is a valet. <laughs> now, I am one of several intellectual valets to Lady Thatcher over the years, and I can assure you very sincerely that she remains a hero to us but a hero, or a heroine, of a very distinctive and unusual kind. Um, I was interested to hear Father Sirico's account of his meeting with uh, Lady Thatcher uh, in 1979, because I have a similar story. My first meeting with Margaret Thatcher was a complete train wreck. Uh, it was at a 1973 lunch of parliamentary journalists, in which I was the only conservative in the room except for her, then the Minister of Education. I promptly had a blazing row with her over Milton Friedman's idea of intellectual, of educational vouchers, which I supported, but which she, then a minister in Ted's Heath, Ted Heath's leftish conservative government, had to oppose. When she left, all of the left-wing journalists in the room fell about laughing and said, you're the only person here who likes her, and she thinks you're some kind of Trotskyist now. <laughs> what none of us realized that day, and what came obviously to the uh, assistance of Father Sirico, what none of us realized that day, it was that Margaret Thatcher liked people to argue with her. She loved, de loves debate, the rougher the better. If someone stands up to her, they rise in her estimation. I had stood up to her quite uncharacteristically, I can assure you. Um, but not only that, I had done so from the right. Even before the phrase had been invented, therefore, I was, quote, one of us, unquote. Thereafter, whenever I ran into her in Parliament, in lunches, or at the annual Tory conference, she was always happy to chat. And when she needed someone reliable to write the Tory manifesto for the 87 election, she invited me to join her staff in Downing Street. So I saw her at the height of her powers. Now, at the height of her powers, Margaret Thatcher was a combination of towering world historical figure and an ordinary English middle-class housewife, a blend, so to speak, of Bismarck and Carrie Puta. She bustled everywhere. She drove fierce arguments through debates in committee. She stalked the House of Commons corridors of power like an avenging angel. She had the kind of administrative stamina that Tony Blair lacked and that explains why so many of his bright ideas remained just that, whereas she accomplished several revolutions of policy. But she also gave her feminine side full reign. She was and is a great plumper of cushions, opener and closer of windows, rearranger of furniture in order to make quite sure that her guests are comfortable. And that was true when she was prime minister. I would say that she was hyperactive, except that she had exceptional powers of concentration. So, Father, you might want to rename the award the Faith, Freedom and Good Housekeeping Award. Ministers were repeatedly thrown off guard by her in office because she seemed to know more about, the more than they did, about their own departmental policy and especially about its weaknesses. I was a special advisor to the Prime Minister in Downing Street on a range of policies and I would like to be able to claim that her successes were the results of brilliant critiques of ministerial documents that we special advisors supplied her with. I think she did benefit from her efforts, to be honest, but she certainly did not depend on them. I can remember on one occasion, the Ministry of Defense turned out in force, complete with senior military officers in full rig, with full fig, with scrambled eggs on the peaks of their caps, uh, and uh, in order to defend an especially costly weapon system. Glancing through her papers, she pointed out a flaw in the MOD case that had escaped the attention of everybody else, including me. It was a critical flaw as well, and a knockout blow. All the defense secretary could say in response was, well, we shall have to go back and reconsider that, Prime Minister, which in Whitehall terms was a defeat comparable to the first Afghan war. <laughs> now, you get to know someone well when you're working for them. Mrs. Thatcher was the most kind and considerate boss I've had. She was always worrying about her colleagues' health, 
taking, advising them to take the holidays she avoided taking herself. But she was a firm boss. She never gave less than her best, and she expected similarly high standards, hard work, and value from the taxpayer for all those working for her. And the higher up the ladder you were, the tougher she was on you. Her distribution of kicks and kisses was the reverse of the usual hierarchical one in Whitehall. She kicked up and she kissed down. The doorman, the ladies who served tea, the typists, her beloved detectives, they could do no wrong. Um, when a waitress at Checkers accidentally poured soup into the lap of the foreign secretary, she famously leapt up and comforted the waitress. Ministers, civil servants, top advisors, anyone from the Foreign Office, well, they must have sometimes felt they could do no right. And to be honest, maybe she sometimes made too little allowance for the nervousness that even senior officials felt on being cross-examined by her. On one, one occasion, she subjected a new scientific advisor to her usual tough interrogation. As he was being carried limp from the room, she lamented sotto voce, why do people take everything I say so seriously? <laughs> the truth is that even though she was Prime Minister and by the mid-1980s a famous international leader, Margaret Thatcher never thought of herself as someone special. On rare occasions, she could be intellectually arrogant. She was always personally humble. Let me give you a homely illustration of this. After six o'clock, I had a second job in Downing Street, this one unpaid. I helped to write political party speeches for her. Civil servants, under the rules, uh, can only help to write official speeches. Tory speeches have to be written after hours, well into the night sometimes, without the help of civil servants, including cooks, uh, waiters, and typists. Dinner and drinks, therefore, had to be provided by the Prime Minister herself. Sometimes a typist would arrive from conservative central office with a Marks and Spencer's lasagna or a shepherd's pie. At other times, however, Mrs. Thatcher would bustle into the kitchen and come back with a frying pan of her own bacon and eggs. And very good they were. These occasions afforded a much more relaxed, direct, and personal atmosphere of working with her. We used to say, you know, no one writes speeches for Margaret Thatcher. They write speeches with Mrs. Thatcher. And she would engage in candid discussions over the whole range of government policy in order to work out on these occasions, in order to work out a broad conservative political agenda. There was a small um, camaraderie of people, really. West, there was a, one of us was a quite well-known West End playwright, Ronnie Miller, um, her political secretary, Stephen Sherborne, um, the indispensable Charles Powell, her guru on foreign policy, and she would preside over really lively and interesting, friendly debates between us. Now, there were constant arguments and, between the speech giver and the speech writers, more often about words and jokes than about high policy. But she was the consummate political professional. She rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed, and on the day, she always delivered the final speech beautifully. Usually, she brought the house down. You saw her little operation with the, with the not the mop, the, the duster there. Well, she used to do those things all the time. And Ronnie Miller, as I say, a, a veteran of many a West End play and a Hollywood script, used to say in his kind of old-fashioned, fruity, theatrical tones, dear boy, I've dealt with dozens of leading ladies, and I'm telling you, Margaret's the real thing. A, a diva, a star. You see her looking like something the cat dragged in, her hair flat, her makeup awry, her clothes crumpled, her spirits low. Then the drums roll, the lights dim, the curtain rises, and out she steps looking like a billion dollars. That's the mark of a star, dear boy. They always rise to the big occasion. So she was someone special after all in that sense. But what then, as a, what was she like as a political leader, in particular as the leader of a struggle to defend and advance freedom? Well, in brief, she was the most consistent, the most outspoken, the most determined, and the most reliable friend to Reagan and the United States in the final struggle with totalitarian communism. 
I know you will be very well aware of her role in that and in Reagan's role in the West victory over the Soviet Union. So I, I'll deal with this br briefly. But she matched Reagan's military buildup with the strengthening of Britain's defense forces. She was the strongest voice in Western Europe, protesting against the imposition of martial law uh, against solidarity in Poland. She supplied blowpipe missiles to the Afghan resistance that gave Reagan the incentive and the justification to insist that American intelligence agencies should then supply them with the more effective Stinger missiles. She rallied the Europeans to ensure the installation of US missiles in Western Europe to match the Soviet planting of SS-20s in the Soviet satellite countries. Let me give one example of the many times she acted to stiffen the spines of West European governments, either weakened by the leftward drift of their social democratic parties or frightened by the massive rallies of the so-called peace movement. West Germany's Helmut Schmidt, a friend of America's and a strong anti-communist, was in the early 1980s losing the battle to keep his own left-leaning SDP party from opposing the installation of US missiles. So he asked Lady Mrs. Thatcher if she would take some of the missiles that West Germany had originally accepted in addition to those already being taken by Britain. She agreed to do so. Both Schmidt and the installation policy were able to survive for another day, and in the end, such strong leadership ensured that the missiles were installed across Western Europe in 1984, Germany fully included after Helmut Kohl replaced Schmidt. I have always believed that that was the decisive defeat for the Soviet Union in the Cold War. They lost their long-cherished hope of being able to employ nuclear blackmail against NATO and to split the Atlantic Alliance. Yes, they walked out of the Geneva arms control negotiations in protest, but they then had to walk back again a short time later. And later still, in the Geneva, Reykjavik, and Washington summits, they had to swallow disarmament treaties that essentially demolished their military threat to Western Europe. At that point, the Cold War had been won militarily. The summits merely ratified those victories. If that victory was vital, however, and it was, what of Mrs. Thatcher's role in reviving British capitalism and helping to change world capitalism and to extend a regime of economic freedom? Owen Harries, the distinguished Australian editor of the National Interest magazine, once remarked that Mrs. Thatcher might be regarded by history as more important than Reagan on the matter of economic reform. And I think that that is a justifiable judgment. I would give the following reasons for it. First, the recovery of the British economy in the 1980s was more impressive than America's revival because it started from a lower economic point and occurred in a more left-wing country. Jimmy Carter may have been moderately efficient at ruining an economy, but he was no match for 50 years of socialism and labor governments. <laughs> Secondly, Thatcher had harder opposition to overcome. Her labor market deregulation had to run the gauntlet not only of labor MPs in the House of Commons, but also of timid Tory wets. Third, even once her reforms had passed into law, her labor and economic policies had to survive major revolutionary challenges from the labor unions, notably the 1984-85 miners' strike. That was a bitterly hard-fought battle, and the wounds are still fresh with some people. But it was also, it, con it concluded in a victory for Mrs. Thatcher as important in domestic politics as the Falklands War was for her in foreign policy. It removed the last lingering nervous fear of both voters and markets that labor unions could render Britain ungovernable and the elected government impotent. It weakened the extreme left everywhere, including in the Labour Party, by demonstrating that its trump card of its national strike was a busted flush. Though Labour took some years to recognize the fact, Thatcher's victory entrenched her economic and labor reforms as the new consensus of British politics. Once that happened, as Harry's pointed out, the British economy began its long boom combining economic growth with price stability. Loss-making industries were closed down or reduced in size. Manufacturing industries shed labor, often while increasing output as they restructured to meet foreign competition. 
New companies or entrepreneurs from academic and non-industrial backgrounds established new industries in the financial services, information, and high-tech sectors. Privatization transformed inefficient state-owned industries into dynamic private sector ones, a good example being British Airways. New financial instruments allowed entrepreneurs to take over sluggish low-earning companies and put their assets to more profitable uses. In general, Thatcher's British economy, like Reagan's revived American economy, was characterized by change, profitability, growth, the better allocation of resources, including labor, and the emergence of new industries, indeed an entirely new economy based on the information revolution. Allied with these reforms was the spread of capital ownership. Thatcher had drawn the battle lines with labor in a 1987 election speech. Labor believes in turning workers against owners, she said. We believe in turning workers into owners. Two thirds of Britain's state owned industries were sold to the private sector. Between 1979 and 1981, the proportion of the British public owning shares rose from 7% to almost 30%. And more than a million people brought their own, bought their own homes from often reluctant local labor authorities. There was a social side to this economic liberalization also. And this was more, if more significant in Britain than in America, which has long had a strong enterprise culture under governments of both parties. Here is Thatcher's very brilliant finance minister, Nigel Lawson, pointing out some of the signs he saw of a growing enterprise culture in Britain in those years. For, I quote, for many years, there was an average increase of 500 new firms per week after, after deducting closures. There was a rise from little more than 1 million to over 3 million in the number of self-employed. The UK venture capitalist industry, which scarcely existed when she entered office, had by 1985 become twice as large as its counterparts in the rest of the European community taken together. And I would underpin this with something from my own life. When I graduated uh, um, in, from London University in 1964, there was not a single member of my graduating class, at least any I knew, who intended to start his or her own business. They all wanted to become trainee managers at major corporations like Imperial uh, Chemical Industries or Metalbox. 20 years later, at the height of the Thatcher Revolution, half the science graduates of Cambridge intended to start their own software company, and half the graduates of the Royal College of Arts in Kensington became famous fashion designers within weeks of putting out their shingles. And that transformation did not stop at the edge of the Atlantic. Thatcher and Reagan also changed the world economy by virtue of the demonstration effects of Reaganism and Thatcherism. They had provided the world with successful models of free and deregulated economies, and they pioneered a new and more flexible form of information capitalism. Now, those demonstration effects were similar. Reaganism and Thatcherism were, diff were the same set of ideas applied in different national circumstances, but they weren't identical. Tax cuts were America's principal, principal intellectual export here. Privatization was Britain's. And of the two, I would argue that privatization was more important globally, since the third world and post-communist economies were held back by a vast number of inefficient state industries. Privatization, not incidentally, became one of the city of London's most profitable services over the next two decades. And even the Soviets and West European communists were forced to change course by, the wide, by its wide adoption. Once the command economies of the Soviet bloc collapsed in 1989, revealing the extraordinary bankruptcy of state planning, it was the Thatcher model that most of the new democracies mainly sought to emulate. So she was a truly significant figure in the development, the defeat of communism, and in the revival of capitalism. So let me then turn to the third question. What was Margaret Thatcher like as a Christian believer? Well, she was, of course, a Christian believer. She was brought up as a Methodist in the English Midlands provincial town of Grantham. Methodism in the England of the, in, in, in the, England of the 1920s and 30s was the religion most commonly adopted by the small business and professional middle class and rising respectable working class. It was orthodox in belief. It placed stress on hard work and self-reliance. 
It was the basis of a fairly rich community life in um, many of the towns and cities, of, uh, uh, particularly of the Midlands. Um, but it was somewhat puritanical, except in encouraging love of church music, understandably so, given the powerful hymns that the Wesley brothers had composed. In the first chapter of her second volume of memoirs, The Path to Power, and, and I would, if you really want to understand what, what shaped her, that is something to read. Mrs. Thatcher gives a very vivid account of her childhood in Methodism. And reading between the lines, one can see that she felt that music part, um, Methodism was somewhat lacking in aesthetic comfort and delight and could have was perhaps a bit thin on the entertainment side. She said to me, she said to me once that because the little Catholic girls making their first communion um, were decked out in colored ribbons on their white dresses, anyone in the Methodist chapel who wore colored ribbons would be told it's the first step to Rome. <laughs> she seemed to me to be somewhat envious on this score. Well, Mrs. Thatcher be ceased to be a Methodist and became an Anglican when she married Dennis Thatcher. Now, this was not a particularly great leap since Methodism itself began as an evangelical branch of Anglicanism, and I believe that Wesley himself re regarded himself as an Anglican right to the day of his death. Um, Mrs. Thatcher, in my view, um, uh, though she is today an Anglican, uh, has, has, will always be in part a Methodist. It is part of her personality. It, it truly shaped her and explains a great deal about her. Um, but the fact is the, um, the, the differences between Anglican and Methodism were not the only reason why it was relatively easy for her to make this change. Another is that she is totally devoid of anything resembling religious or denominational bigotry, which anyway has been a dying thing, in, was a dying thing in England after the Second World War. This was, uh, did have some significant uh, political effects, however. In Downing Street and in the cabinet, she surrounded herself with both Catholics and with Jews in high positions. Indeed, the prominence of um, Jews in uh, her cabinet led Harold Macmillan, her predecessor as prime minister, um, to crack a, a mildly anti-Semitic joke. He said, my cabinet was full of old Etonians. Her cabinet is full of old Estonians. But if we ask the question um, more deeply, what kind of Christian believer it is, I think, I think the answer comes really from um, three uh, stories uh, attached to one of the biggest events of her life. Ben Wattenberg, the American uh, uh, demo political demographer, has said that um, there are moments in lives, moments of political nakedness, in which people see suddenly and clearly and unambiguously what someone is really like. Um, such a moment occurred uh, for Ronald Reagan when he was shot and the American people saw how gallantly and bravely he behaved uh, at the time. And that transformed their view of him. Um, as David Broder said, no one will now be able to say that Reagan is a callow or cruel or thoughtless man. Mrs. Thatcher's moment of political nakedness of that kind occurred when the IRA tried to murder her by blowing up the Grand Hotel in Brighton. As though you will, as some of you will recall, um, she, the, 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 the bomb went off, it killed five people, it injured a great many more, it destroyed a large chunk of the hotel, and it came within, I would say, four or five minutes of killing her, because the suite in which she was in uh, had a bathroom that was, in which she had been uh, five minutes before, which was totally destroyed uh, by the bomb. She had left that bathroom, come into the sitting room, and the sitting room was not particularly badly damaged, of course. Um, uh, so the police uh, came, uh, took the Thatchers away, and uh, th here are the three stories. The first is, what did she do immediately afterwards? Well, immediately afterwards, she had to listen to the police. But when she got to the police station, um, she and uh, Mrs. Crawford, a woman who looked after her clothes and things, they went off to a bedroom where they knelt down and prayed. That was the very first reaction. The second thing she did was the following morning, she had to give a speech at the Conservative Party conference, which she did. It was 
she felt it was a kind of democratic duty to show that the terrorism had not defeated a democratic uh, party conference. But immediately after that, she went to the hospital in Brighton where practically all of the um, casualties of that night were being treated. Um, and there was something quite interesting happened there. Um, John Wakeham, uh, one of her close friends, who had been, um, uh, whose legs had been very, very badly crushed, um, she was told he almost certainly wouldn't, wouldn't walk again. And then she said, well, who's the best person in the world? And they said it was somebody who was um, a doctor in El Salvador. So she spent about um, an hour and a half, two hours, trying to track this man down in El Salvador. And when eventually she got through to someone who knew where he was, it turned out that he was on a sabbatical and he was in the hospital where she was phoning from. <laughs> and, and so she got, she, she, that, that, she, she got him to take care of John and that saved his legs. The third is a slightly different story. Um, it is um, that when I was writing my book, I, I interviewed her on several things, and on one occasion, I, uh, I said to her, oh, I'm writing about the assassination attempts on you, Pope John Paul, and Ronald Reagan. And I wonder, could you uh, tell me, you, 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 you were probably aware that both Reagan and the Pope um, feel that God intervened to save them, their lives, for some great purpose. Do you think that God intervened to spare your life for some great purpose? And she said, no. Now, um, I thought she'd say that, but I questioned her as to her view, and she said, well, wouldn't it be somewhat vainglorious of me to think that? After all, five people, friends of mine, died that night. Why would God particularly single me out? Now, as a matter of fact, I think that's bad theology. God intervening to spare your life, he's may not, I mean, he may be sparing your life, but he may have a, a very tough task for you. I mean, it's not, a, it's not necessarily, it's not a mark of favor, so to speak, necessarily. And, um, but secondly, I think it shows her in a very human and decent life, and uh, uh, it demonstrates her humility. She really didn't feel happy about the idea that others had perished when she, uh, in, 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 when she had um, been saved. Um, I deduced from these three stories, her prayers, her immediate action in relation to um, helping the wounded, and her response to my question, that she is an active, muscular, and humble Christian. She may not be a theologian, but she never intended to go into that business. And what she, what she is is someone who feels that Christianity is a force that impels her to try to make the world a better place. And this is where I make the link between the woman herself and her political achievements, between herself and a creed called Thatcherism. All of the economic changes I was describing above and the motive behind them were a revival of what Shirley Robin Letwin, the distinguished Anglo-American political theorist, called the vigorous virtues. She wrote a, a study of Thatcherism, which is regarded by the experts as being philosophically very important. And she, in that book, says that all of the, all of the changes and reforms are basically designed to change something in Britain. They are to revive qualities like self-reliance, diligence, thrift, trustworthiness, and initiative, qualities which enable people who exhibit them to live and work independently and self-reliant, and, and in a self-reliant way, in society. These vigorous virtues are not the only virtues. Compassion might be called one of the softer virtues, but they are essential to the success workings of a free economy and a civil society, both of which rely, <coughs> excuse me, both of which rely on dispersed initiative and self-reliant citizens. Now, I think that, in a way, is the key to Mrs. Thatcher. Um, it describes her in a way better than she's ever described herself. She is sometimes accused of denying a Christian responsibility for others because of her remark, there is no such thing as society. That criticism is entirely upside down. Her remark was not a denial of our responsibility for others, but an assertion of such a responsibility. She was saying that society is not a thing. 
that we cannot shuffle our responsibility for others off onto an abstract entity called society because we are society. And since that is so, the softer virtues such as compassion cannot be exerted by people who lack the vigorous virtues of self-reliance and thrift. Her favorite saying, quoted many times to me and to others, and I think it's in the speech of the Church of Scotland, her favorite saying from John Wesley was, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. And in her response to the bishops uh, who wrote a critique of her policy, politics in the faith of the city, she argued as Father Sirico reminded us that the good Samaritan could have given very little help to the, um, the Jewish man who'd been attacked if he had nothing in his purse. The self-reliance, sorry, forgive me, the reliance of charity upon the vigorous virtues may not be a theological novelty, but it is an important social insight and its inventor and best practitioner fully deserves the Faith and Freedom Award that I will be proud and happy to hand over to Lady Thatcher next week. Thank you very much. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of. If you're familiar with our past content or have attended an Acton event and would like to see it in a future episode, you can email us at producer at Until next week, we're Acton Vault. I'm Gabriel Zsa. Zsa.